I'm going to start talking about movement disorders. <clears throat> and you're going to notice a couple of things here changing. Um, one, the sound quality is going to change back and forth because um, some of this I'm including from last spring. Uh, if anywhere that I can get the savings from already creating some of these video lectures, I'm, I'm going to. And um, I was on a different laptop last year that has, I think, a slightly better sound quality, but everything takes me so much longer on that laptop that I'm that I'm using this one. That one has issues. Um, you'll also notice, so usually I'll listen to these and I'll take out anything that where I was really talking to my class. Um, I got to know them before spring break and I really enjoy seeing and getting to know my class and I still refer to them uh, sometimes um, throughout. So I will fix that normally, but I did not do that for today's lecture because, so I refer to spring break, but um, it was because it was on that slide where I'm uh, describing the basal ganglia and it's really a lot of concentration for me to walk through how the basal ganglia work. I usually draw it out for myself every semester and talk through it twice before I go do it in front of a class because it's quite complicated. And while I kind of have it in my head, it's not something that I could say clearly without practicing it. So I thought that's going to take me quite a while and I don't want to, I don't want to do all that. Um, so I'll try not to I'll try not to make it too confusing where I'm I'm referring back to things that are different days and things from last semester, but today I left this as as it was. You might also notice, so there might also be a change in my energy level. I did not enjoy making these video lectures last uh last spring, but I had a lot more energy about it and I think I was having a little bit more fun with it than I am this fall as I'm just more tired and um, going into town a lot and it's it's all been a, a bit much. So I think there's probably going to be a bit of a change there as well. But anytime I change a slide and have to talk over it to, because I've said something to the class, it's going to this sound quality change is going to happen as well. Uh, but the movement disorders are very interesting. So uh, I will let you get started on uh, learning about those. OK. So these are the structures that are part of the basal ganglia. Uh, you can click on the yellow link there to, I think it's to go to, I think it's Khan Academy, and they will, I think it is the um, direct pathway, the description of the direct pathway, and then what you'll see to the right is that there's also a description of the indirect pathway. I'm going to quickly give a description of the direct pathway. Okay, and this is, we went over this briefly in class before spring break. And I'm just going it over, over it again briefly because it helps to make sense of the movement disorders and what's going on. So the direct pathway, what's happening here is we have the substantia nigra. They're communicating to the striatum. Uh, we also have, so I decide to make a movement and my motor cortex communicates to the striatum. So the striatum includes the caudate nucleus and the putamen. You can see them over to the um, far right. They are actually what they're doing is inhibiting an inhibitor in the direct pathway. So what's usually happening, if you look over to your left on the, at the thalamus, the thalamus is doing a lot of communication with the motor cortex. And so if we weren't inhibiting this, we would just be moving all the time. But what we're doing is we're inhibiting this with the globus pallidus internal. So the globus pallidus internal has a lot of spontaneous activity and it is inhibiting all of this possible motor movement, okay? Because that motor cortex, the motor cortex, I decide the movement that I'm going to make, but there are also neurons that are then communicating, right? Communicating on to the neurons, to the motor neurons in the spinal cord. Okay, so what I've been doing when I decide to make a movement consciously is that I'm inhibiting that inhibitor. So the striatum is inhibiting the inhibition of the globus pallidus internal which is allowing me to make the movement. Okay, I'm ceasing to inhibit the movement uh, that, I, that I consciously voluntarily wanna make. That's the direct pathway. The indirect pathway is more complex and I'm not going to describe it uh, to the extent, to that same extent, but what it's basically doing is um, indirectly inhibiting 
the inhibition of the inhibitor. And so what it's doing is it is stopping the uh, inappropriate movement. So when I make a movement, I want to make a specific movement and I don't want to make a lot of inappropriate movements. And that's part of what the indirect pathway is helping me do. But I'm going to ignore that for now. So if we look at the movement disorders, uh, what's going on in the basal ganglia, it, it makes sense of the kind of movement disorders that we end out with. So Parkinson's disease is specifically caused by a loss of those neurons in the substantia nigra. So those neurons that are sending dopamine into this system, both excitatory and inhibitory information going into the striatum. So some of the symptoms that, that occur are um, rigidity and muscle tremors. Uh, some of those movements that we that we really don't want and uh, messages to our muscles that we don't want, but also slow movements and difficulty initiating um, physical movements. So anything where I have to make a spontaneous movement where I'm consciously, voluntarily choosing to move in the absence of something external guiding my action, that is that becomes more difficult. In addition to, uh, there is also if you remember. When we very early on talked about the basal ganglia, it's not just motor activity and that kind of procedural memory. Procedural memory includes this kind of learning of patterns and, and it involves some cognitive um, reasoning. So other symptoms include reasoning deficits and other cognitive deficits and memory deficits that include that kind of procedural um, memory. Symptoms also include uh, people often have some depression, which is understandable considering they know what's going on and, and what's happening with them. They also early on often have a loss of a severe loss of olfaction, which makes it clear that that especially if there's any predisposition, that this is something that is occurring in their life, that they have Parkinson's. Again, one of the main, uh, the, the main cause of Parkinson's, what's happening at the substantia nigra, we'll talk about how exactly this is occurring, how much there is a predisposition versus environmental influences, but we have this gradual progressive death of the neurons in the substantia nigra. So this really um, low level midbrain structure that uh, produces dopamine to send into this system. So a treatment that has been around for decades, really, for Parkinson's disease is L-DOPA. It uh, crosses the blood-brain barrier, which dopamine itself does not. It's a precursor to dopamine, so we can create dopamine from L-DOPA. If you go back to your biosynthesis, this is one of the intermediate steps after the original amino acids um, to create dopamine. I have on here a link. Uh, this is a link I, that I hope you all watch this is Michael J. Fox talking about his own Parkinson's, showing some of the symptoms and what he goes through, as well as um, providing some advocacy, which he has been doing for a couple decades now since he uh, realized that he had Parkinson's. Your author goes through a number of different treatments because L-DOPA is not ideal. It is creating the release of dopamine in other dopaminergic pathways, it's, uh, it causes side effects, sometimes hallucinations, delusions. So one of the things that is more recently, more that they've tried more recently is um, transplanting stem cells or small structures in the brain. And um, he goes through several of those different kinds of treatments. The only one I'm going to talk about other than L-DOPA is this deep brain stimulation. It's a treatment for Parkinson's that looks very promising and that they've actually that they're actually trying on humans. All the other ones have been on uh, animal models. So um, they do the deep brain stimulation. I can't remember how much exactly we talked about it, but they're going in and they're exciting or stimulating particular neurons. And you can see what they've marked here in this picture is the thalamus. I assumed it would be the substantia nigra, but I guess because those neurons are actually degenerating and we're losing them completely, that um, what they want to stimulate is the is the thalamus. And I have had at least one student talk about, I think it was her grandfather, and um, tell me how much this was helping him, helping to slow um, the progression of Parkinson's. 
if we go back to the question of what causes Parkinson's, clearly it is the loss of these neurons in the substantia nigra, but the question is what's causing that? And so they have identified at least 28 genes that are um, that predispose somebody to having Parkinson's. If you get one of these genes, maybe even two of these genes, you probably don't have a lot of um, chance of developing Parkinson's, but the more genes you have, the more likely it is that you're gonna develop Parkinson's disease. There's also, an environmental component to all of this, where if you're exposed to pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, um, any of those tox any of those kinds of toxins, you're more likely to have Parkinson's disease. One of the reasons they've even looked towards environment and towards toxins was from um, uh, an incident back in 1982 in Northern California where some young people took synthetic heroin. Uh, that had this chemical in it, this MPTP, which is uh, an abbreviation for a very long chemical name, and that became becomes in the body MPP+, which is another really long chemical name, and that chemical destroys those neurons in the substantia nigra, which had them looking towards uh, more environmental causes. Also, interestingly, I think, there are correlations. So there's a correlation that the more people smoke, the less likely they are to get Parkinson's disease. There is a relationship between, there's a balance between dopamine and some of these other neurotransmitter systems. And one of them is dopamine with acetylcholine. And um, nicotine is an acetylcholine agonist. So smoking apparently uh, lessens your chance of getting Parkinson's disease, but I would not recommend if you have Parkinson's disease in your family to go start smoking cigarettes since many, many other uh, disorders and diseases are correlated with with smoking, uh, not just lung cancer and other types of cancers, but other disorders as well. The other thing that's correlated with Parkinson's is drinking coffee uh, with not getting Parkinson's. So the more coffee, uh, the first time I read about it, it was somebody said one of the textbooks said if you the people who drank between three to five cups of coffee a day were less likely to get Parkinson's disease. Your book says people who are drinking 10 cups of coffee a day are less likely to get Parkinson's disease. For me, that's a lot of coffee. So if I drink more than two cups of coffee a day, I usually, I'm like a squirrel on crack up in front of my students. So that's never gonna happen. But um, apparently the more coffee you drink, the less likely you are to get Parkinson's disease. The other movement disorder that's discussed in your textbook is Huntington's disease, sometimes known as Huntington, Huntington's chorea. Uh, chorea means to dance, as they are, which is a pretty pejorative term to discuss how these these people um, will have some a lot of unwanted movement. So early on, they're going to have some jerks and twitches and things. And, but that's going to spread to other parts of the body and develop into writhing. Eventually, they'll also have the same, a similar kind of problem as um, people with Parkinson's, where they are having difficulty with voluntary movements like walking and speaking and typing and other things like that. Uh, they also have that lack of ability to learn and improve new movements and some of those cognitive deficiencies that come from the kind of procedural memory that's being lost because of the loss of the basal ganglia. They also, often before we even see these um, movement symptoms, have a, a host of possible psychological disorders, including depression, uh, problems with their sleep, um, memory impairment, anxiety, uh, short fuse, kind of irritation, they can have hallucinations and delusions, make poor judgment. Um, they often have some alcoholism, some kind of substance abuse problems, and they have uh, sexual disorders ranging from a complete lack of interest and, and kind of apathy towards sex to being overly sexualized. What causes Huntington's disease? Uh, again, we see uh, it is the basal ganglia and damage to the basal ganglia, which is which gradually we see a loss of neurons and this time not in the substantia nigra that are feeding into the basal ganglia system, but in the striatum. So um, what your what this these pictures are showing, which is they are slightly different than your textbook. Your textbook is actually 
uh, much more disturbing as those are real uh, human cadaver uh, brains. But this is more idealized. And you can see on the right in B that the lateral ventricles are physically larger because of the neurons around the ventricles are have died off. Okay, that they've been damaged and they're and they're gone. Uh, the question, just like with Parkinson's, is well, what causes that? And it with Huntington's disease, this appears to be completely genetic. It is an autosomal dominant gene. So somebody whose parents, who has a parent who has Huntington's disease, has a 50% chance of getting Huntington's disease. Uh, they do have a test for it now, and the question is, do you do you want to test and find out that you have this um, debilitating disorder that will most likely kill you within within 15 years, or do you want to eh, live your life and and not know until it's time until you start to see the, the symptoms? Uh, they discovered the protein Huntington. Uh, from Huntington's disease, and in its mutant form, Huntington um, uh, just impairs, it's throughout the body, but it just impairs the, the brain and the, the mitochondria and uh, potassium um, in, in neurons. Uh, what's happening is that on chromosome 4, uh, we all have a number of repeats of cytosine, adenine, guanine, so those nucleotides repeat uh, typically between 11 and 24 times. If they repeat up to about 35, 36 times, you're safe from Huntington's. Uh, but if they repeat more than 35 times, you have some amount of chance of getting Huntington's. And the more they repeat, so they're actually coding for uh, glutamine. And so the more repeats of this coding for glutamine that people have, the more likely they are to get Huntington's and the more likely it is to be severe and the younger that they're likely to to get it. So your author has a couple of graphs and pictures that show um, this relationship between the number of repeats and the how young someone is when they get the disease and when they get other kinds of diseases as well. My very last slide is another link. So I think for both of these movement disorders, they're uh, very interesting and it's important to see them uh, kind of side by side. And so I will recommend again that you go back and watch Michael J. Fox with his Parkinson's disease and that you watch some of this link of um, this doctor who has Huntington's disease so that you can um, see uh, how, the, how these differ really. Um, I don't usually show this whole link. I usually show about seven or eight, maybe nine minutes of, of this. And this is usually where we end talking about movement disorders where I start asking students. So think about, think about what you see as far as what's, what's similar and what's different uh, between people who have these disorders.